Well, hello, welcome back. This will be part two of the notes for the unit on solutions. So in part one, um, we looked at a general way of classifying uh, different kinds of matter. So um, the easiest way to break it down is some substances are pure substances and some are mixtures of different substances. So we're going to focus on the mixtures. And you remember that within mixtures, there were homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures. The homogeneous were the ones where they were so well mixed together, you really couldn't tell one from the other. Well, another name for a homogeneous mixture is a solution. So I didn't bring that up at the time, um, and neither did the, the, um, the woman who did the video. But now I just want you to consider that that, um, that label on that little chart could be replaced with the word solution. So I'm going to really use that as a definition for what a solution is. Okay, so maybe you can get this down just below where you drew the diagram for part one and put the other stuff there. A solution is, and we'll just start with that, a homogeneous mixture. Big word to spell there. Again, just remind you what that means. It means when you look at it, you're not going to be able to tell that it's a mixture of different things. It all looks like the same stuff. Okay, Lots of mixtures look that way. If you look at your bottle of Gatorade, or if you look at um, you know, a bottle of Coca-Cola, or if you look at milk, um, milk is what we call homogenized. That means they break it, up, they break it up into such small little pieces. There's actually a little bit of what they call milk fat in there, but they break it up, they whip it around so fast, breaks it into these little pieces, and it becomes so well mixed you can't tell that it's, on, or that it's a mixture of things. It just looks like the same stuff. Now, if you let it settle for maybe a week or so, or if you leave milk for a while, it will settle out, and some of those solids will go down to the bottom. Um, so it's a homogeneous mixture, and it is made of, there's like two parts to a solution. And the way I'll describe it is this way. The two parts are called the solute and the solvent. And the solute is dissolved in or into the solvent. Okay? So when you dissolve one thing into the other, the stuff you're dissolving Oftentimes you think of that as like a solid, like when you did or if you did that salt water solution, you took a little bit of salt, that was your solute, and you put it in water, which was your solvent. In a lot of the solutions that we're familiar with, water is the solvent, okay? And so the salt dissolves into the, the water, okay? Um, the solvent is the more abundant. of the two. So you're always going to have more solvent than you have solute. Okay? Um, this is really important. I'm going to show you this in just a second. So when you have a solution, each part of it, the solute, the solvent, retains its own properties. Now, sometimes there are some slight differences in the properties, and we'll actually talk about that in a little bit. Um, but the, um, the salt will still taste salty. It's just such small little pieces that you can't see it. So I'm going to get back here. I think that salt water that I made a while ago. Oh, yeah, there it is. Now I'm going to show you this. Actually, let me put it under here. Yeah, can you see that? That's crystals of salt, okay? And I told you we should never do this in the lab, but yeah, yeah, that's really, really salty, okay? It's actually kind of wet, wet, salty um, residue right there. And depending on how much you made, if you made this, again, this was last Thursday, um, the 23rd, that I had you mix a little salt into some water. So if you made some yourself, you may have um, something to look at 
and um, if it was all clean and the container you used was clean and everything, go ahead and just take a little a little taste of it, and you'll tell that that is exactly salt that you have there. So all we did was we separated the water, the solvent, out of the solution, and we were left with the solute, which is the table salt. Okay. So while each substance retained its own properties, some of these properties can be a little bit different when things are mixed together as opposed to when they're separate. I'll give you an example. The boiling point of water, or any solvent for that matter, tends to rise with a solute in it. Okay. In order for water to boil, we talked about this in the first semester, those particles of water have to break free from each other. They're actually held pretty tightly to each other. And so that energy that we get in there from the fire or whatever we're using tends to energize those, and eventually they break free. Well, the salt actually helps to hold those things together. So it takes even more energy, a higher temperature, for those to break free. And similarly, in order for the, for the water to freeze, um, and for those uh, things to arrange themselves so that they have a solid now, the, um, the, the particles of the solute also get in the way of that. And so you actually have to lower the temperature even more. So freezing points, that's the temperature at which the liquid will freeze, tends to lower when you have a solid solute in it. That's why we use salt on the roads in the winter time. It actually lowers the, the temperature at which that water would freeze. And so instead of freezing at maybe 32 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe we can get down to 25 or so, which depending on what the temperature is, that might mean you get to go to school the next day. Another property is what we call conductivity. So salt water is a good example of that, which means they will conduct electricity. So if you try to pass electricity through pure water, it doesn't actually go very well. But if you have salt water in there, you can get electricity to pass through that pretty easily. And the more uh, salt that's dissolved in the water, the easier it is for that electricity to pass through there. Okay? I'm not going to get into the details of why that is, but I will tell you that that's some, um, one of the important properties that some solutions have. It depends on what the solution is. So what I'm showing you here is a little bit more about the actual process of dissolving. So this is a little animation that I found online, and it shows some salt crystals. That's the green and white there, made up of sodium and chlorine. And each of those is either positively or negatively charged. The, um, the green ones are the, uh, the chlorine, and they are negatively charged, and the white ones are the sodium, they are positively charged. Well, water itself, well, those are the kind of Mickey Mouse shapes. Those are um, also charged, but um, the oxygen, I'm going to replay it here, the oxygen end of a water molecule is negatively charged. So positives and negatives attract each other. So what you'll find is the two little Mickey Mouse ears, if you will, those are the positive parts of the water, they're going to attract the negative chloride ions and actually pull them away from the sodium because they're more strongly pulled than what the sodium and the chloride are pulled to each other. And then the red ends, the negative ends, are pulling on the positively charged sodium ions. So eventually these all get pulled away and you have um, complete like surrounding of the water molecules around each of the sodium and the chloride ions. So those are no longer stuck together like a crystal, but they're all kind of separated into tiny invisible things. We call this process dissociation. 
So let's describe dissociation here so we can get that down. This is stuff that would normally be in your textbook I would refer to, but you don't have that obviously, so we'll just write it this way. So we'll just say it's the pulling apart of ionic compounds. And most of you in the first semester learned what ionic compounds are by the solvent. Okay, so that's how the, the solution process actually happens. Now, there are some times where there is no dissociation involved. It's really just a physical, like, mixing together. And um, so it just depends on what the solution is as to how that happens. Okay, and the last thing I want you to recognize is that not every solution has a liquid solvent. The ones that you're most familiar with probably do. But here's a nice little table taken out of your textbook that show other kinds of solutions. And these are very familiar substances. You've just never thought of them as solutions before. But remember what a solution is. It's a homogeneous mixture. That's a mixture of two or more things so well mixed or such small particles that you can't tell that it's a mixture of different things. So look at the first one, for example, air. I mean, this is the air that we live in and we breathe all the time. That is a mixture of lots of different things. The solvent, as we call it, is nitrogen because it's 78% of the air. But there's a ton of other little gases mixed into that. So, you know, you got some oxygen, you got carbon dioxide, you've got trace amounts of argon and um, other things. And so they're all just mixed in there. They each retain their own properties. Okay. So that would be a mixture of a gas and, and a gas. If we have humidity in the summertime, that's liquid water dissolved in to the air, the nitrogen. So that's a liquid solute into a gas solvent. Okay, we would call it humidity or just water vapor in the air. Um, when you have carbon dioxide dissolved in water, that's a carbonated beverage, that's a club soda, things like that. Um, anything that bubbles and fizzes like that when you open it, that would be a gas dissolved into a liquid. And then liquids and liquids. Anytime you mix two liquids together, you store them up and you can't tell that you have two different things, that would be an example of a liquid and a liquid. Whichever one you have more of, remember, is the solvent. Uh, you could dissolve a solid in a liquid, and that's what I did with the salt water, sh sugar. Um, those, again, are the ones that you're most familiar with. Now, we have mixtures of solids, and the most common example are all the different mixtures of metal. So um, we call these alloys, alloys. So alloys of steel, usually it's mostly iron, but depending on what additives we put in with that, we can give the steel different characteristics. It can be stronger. It can be, there's a what's that called stainless steel. Um, stainless steel means it doesn't rust as easily. It can be maybe more moldable. So depending on what properties you want to give it, you mix different, um, different other metals into it. Someday you might take the material science class here where you'll learn about different alloys and you'll actually make some where you can mix different things together to make certain properties in your metal. Okay, so not every, every solution is what you think of as a solution where it's a bottle of some liquid, right? Okay, so you can get that down and then that's going to do it for this part of the notes. Um, and we'll carry on next time with the next step. Thanks for watching.